Hello. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Ooh. Yeah? Great. Ah, oh, there I am. Um, before we get started, I'd like to take a minute to ask you guys to silence your cell phones. Uh, and while you do that, a quick note that the lecture will be followed by a brief Q&A. And then the book signing will take place in the lobby uh, right through those doors in the back. My name is Maya West, and I run the Zell Visiting Writers Series, hosted by the Helen Zell Writers Program, which is the creative writing MFA program here at U of M. Um, we bring a lot of writers to campus, as you can see, term after term. Novelists, poets, short story writers, um, usually over at UMA, the art museum. Our tagline is bringing the world of contemporary literature to Ann Arbor. If you like this, this is the kind of thing that we do, and you should come. Tonight's event, though, is special even by our standards. For many reasons, of course, pertaining to our visitor and his work, but also for us. It's been especially special to be part of something that involves so many other departments and student groups and remarkable individuals. Emily and Mika, there you are, and Jasmine, um, to name a few. All working together to just make this thing happen. Uh, tonight is the culmination of a lot of effort and excitement and heart from a truly committed and motivated segment of the U of M community, many of whom are in this room. A round of applause, please, for them and you, and to welcome the Vietnamese Students Association to this stage. all. We are the University of Michigan's Vietnamese Student Association and are honored to introduce today world-renowned influencer and author Viet Thanh Nguyen. Viet Thanh Nguyen is a university professor, Errol Arnold Chair of English, Professor of English, American Studies and Ethnicity, and Comparative Literature at the University of Southern California. He is also the author of many groundbreaking literary works, including The Sympathizer and The Refugee. Professor Viet Thanh Nguyen was born in Bu Nguyen Thuoc, Vietnam. He came to the United States with his family as a refugee after the fall of Saigon in 1975 and was initially settled in Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, one of four such camps for Vietnamese refugees. He briefly attended UC Riverside and UCLA before settling on UC Berkeley, where he would graduate with degrees in English and Ethnic Studies. He stayed at Berkeley for a PhD in English, moved to Los Angeles for a teaching position at the University of Southern California, and has been there ever since. His numerous literary, literary works include Race and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asian America, and the novel The Sympathizer. The Sympathizer won the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, the Edgar Award for Best First Novel from the Mystery Writers of America, the Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction, the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature in Fiction, along with many, many more. The novel made it to over 30 Book of the Year lists, including The Guardian, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Amazon.com, and the Washington Post. Additionally, he is a critic at large for the Los Angeles Times and a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. He has written for Time, The Guardian, The Atlantic, and other venues. He has been a fellow of the American Council of Learned Societies, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard, and the Fine Arts Work Center. Professor Viet Thanh Nguyen is actively involved with promoting the arts and culture of Vietnamese in the diaspora through two organizations, the Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network, for which he's a co-director, and Diacritics, which is the Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network blog, for which he is the editor. Up next, Professor Emily Lawson will have a few words to share. But before that, the Vietnamese Student Association will have a little fire starter to rise up the energy. Vietnamese Students Association! 
how you get the crowd going. Uh, my name is Emily Porcinkula Lawson. I'm a lecturer for in women's studies, American culture, and Asian Pacific Islander American studies. How do you introduce someone as uniquely accomplished as Viet Thanh Nguyen, author of three books, editor of two anthologies, critic for the Los Angeles Times, opinion writer for the New York Times, and university professor, Errol Arnold Chair, and professor of English, American Studies, and Ethnicity, and Comparative Literature at the University of Southern California? <sighs> yeah. We can start by recognizing that he is exactly the voice we need at this historical moment of horror and resistance. A refugee in a time of rising xenophobia, a survivor of war in an era of ceaseless violence, a transnational visionary in the face of borders and walls, a writer of color in the age of resurgent white supremacy, and last but not least, a teacher at a time when we are bombarded daily with ignorance wrapped in 280 character spit wads. <laughs> Not many people can feel comfortably at home in both academia and the literary world. Vit Nguyen has never been comfortable in either, and his extraordinary success has come despite this common displacement and because of it. A quote from his book, Nothing Ever Dies, applies equally to scholarship and creative writing. Quote, minorities must dissent from the terms that a regime of whiteness offers. They must call forth anger and rage, demand solidarity and revolution, critique whiteness, domination, power, and all the faces of the war machine." Unquote. Vitwin models for all of us, but especially those who have been marginalized and excluded, how to speak our truths, how to define success on our own terms, and how to expose the false choices and trick questions framed by historical ignorance. Uh, are you Vietnamese or American? How did you learn to speak English so well? Why, yeah, that's right, why, why do you sound so angry? And if you don't like it here, why don't you just go back where you came from? Mm -hmm. And just when the glitterati is poised to put him on a pedestal, Vit Nguyen turns the world upside down with defiant humility. He wins the Pulitzer Prize, then writes about the importance of struggles and doubts. He reminds us that rejection is the tip of the iceberg of success, pointing out that he was turned down by all the colleges he applied to except one, and that the sympathizer was passed over by 13 of 14 publishers. He wins a MacArthur, then pens an essay on the problem with our concept of genius, which our possessive society is too quick to attribute to individual greatness rather than collective and communal support. That's right. After years of writing in relative solitude, he reaches the pinnacle of his craft, then uses the platform he's been given to denounce, to denounce privilege and elitism. Nobody earns this level of acclaim without speaking to universal truths about the human condition, war and peace, life and death, love and hate, faith and despair. But Witwin never hesitates to remind the public that his distinctive voice was born of his family, his community, and his scholarly immersion within ethnic studies and Asian American studies. Yeah, you can clap, that's right. Ethnic studies in the house. The Sympathizer is a marvel of satire, suspense, tragedy, and history for all readers. But there are invaluable layers of joy, wit, and erudition spread throughout its pages for those of us who are Professor Wynn's colleagues in Asian American studies. To those of us who understand how race, colonialism, militarism, migration, and heteropatriarchy bring diverse Asian subjects together, hiding in plain sight. The pompous white American scholar who knows everything about the oriental mind is named Richard 
head. <laughs> you know how some men like Richard Cheney, well, you know their nickname. <laughs> His narrator comes from the East to study at Occidental College, then later works for the insufferable chair of an Oriental Studies department who spews out a new microaggression with every breath. The sympathizer story has been written in an re-education camp where confessions are extracted and correct ideas imparted through brute force. Contract this with the subtle and subversive ways Vit Wen uses this narrative to re-educate both the quiet Americans and the not quiet enough Americans in the study of race, war, and refugees. As someone who has been a full-time faculty member teaching Asian American studies for 25 years, I can rest better at night, warm in the knowledge that thousands of readers of The Sympathizer have absorbed the essential lessons of Maxine Hogg Kingston, Trin Min Ha, John Okada, and Carlos Bulosan, most without even realizing it. There is so much more to glean from Bitwin's writing, and if you want to know how to discover it, whether you're a U of M student or a student of life, there are some classes that I can recommend. <laughs> to see me after the lecture. But while the character he composed may be a man of two faces, Vit Wynn is anything but averse to strong stance. He's spoken out against rampant corruption in the administration, the same shameless rule of money and greed over the common good, and the most grotesque displays of a failed presidency, and that's just what he said about his own university. <laughs> He's issued urgent calls for much needed transformation of our entire society, his words empowering those of us who've been dismissed as nothing, but understand that nothing could be more significant. Because to be cast off as nothing is to be marked for exploitation, discrimination, exclusion, rape, colonialism, slavery, and genocide. Like the refugees in Witwin's novel, we, we are revolutionaries in search of a revolution. Our stories live, our stories live. Nothing, nothing ever dies. Vit Nguyen advises us to ignore, quote, the strategists who don't believe it's possible to dramatically change our society, unquote, to instead, quote, be bold and listen to the artists and the outsiders and the radicals and the freaks and the avant-garde and the base and the youth and the anarchists and all those who don't want to do business as usual, unquote, quote. The time has come. So I want to hear from all of you in the house. All of you who are the bold. Yes? The, the outsiders. Yeah? The radicals. The freaks. The avant-garde. The base. The youth. The anarchists. The, you don't want to admit that one, huh? The Vietnamese. The Southeast Asian Americans, the exiles and refugees, the dispossessed and the dreamers, and yeah, that's right, and everyone who did not come here to the Mendelssohn Theater at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor expecting to hear business as usual. Please give a warm, warm, Michigan welcome to Dr. Vit Thanh Nguyen. Thank you. Thank you. I have never had an introduction like that. Uh, <laughs> And that actually makes my life a whole lot harder. Uh, thank you so much to, to Emily uh, and uh, to the Zell Writers Program and to everyone else who is responsible for bringing me out here. Uh, thanks also to the Vietnamese Student Association. You really brought it. And more than that, for those of you who don't know, Mot Hai Ba Yo is what we do before we drink. <laughs> I really wanted a cognac shot at that point because that's how the Vietnamese drink their cognac in shots. Ann Arbor, it's great to be here tonight. 
I'm really, really uh, delighted to, have to, to, to uh, be present here before you. And before we get started, I, I'm going to do what I always do. Yeah. All right. Can't help it. I'm Asian. <laughs> well, besides being Asian, I'm also a refugee. And it feels kind of weird for me to say that because I wonder... Uh, if I'm still a refugee, I mean, clearly when you look at me, I've made this transition from refugee to bourgeoisie, <laughs> from camps to clubs. I've been invited to all kinds of clubs I never even imagined existed before the Pulitzer Prize. But I still call myself a refugee. I still, I still feel like a refugee because my first memories are of being a refugee. My family came here to the United States in 1975, fleeing the Vietnam War. And we ended up in one of four refugee camps that had been set up to hold us. Ours happened to be Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania. I was four years old. And what I remember, the first thing I remember, was being taken away from my parents. Because what happened is that in order to leave one of these refugee camps, Vietnamese refugees had to have an American sponsor. But there wasn't a single sponsor that would take all four of us, my parents, my brother, and me. So one sponsor took my parents, one sponsor took my 10-year-old my brother, and one sponsor took four-year-old me. And what I remember is howling and screaming being taken away from my parents. And that's why I take it personally when we hear stories today about children being taken away from their parents at the border. Because I feel there is no justification for that. We can have arguments over the state of our immigration policies, but we shouldn't be having arguments over taking children away from their parents. Because, <laughs> because that experience of being taken away from my parents, even if it was for my own good, because the intent behind that was to give my parents time to get on their feet, even with that intention, my four-year-old self could not understand that. And I have a child myself, I have a son, he's five, but when he turned four, I couldn't help but look at him and think of how difficult it would be if he was taken away from me, how painful it would be for him, how painful it would be for me. And in my case, it was only for a few months. My brother, who was 10 years old, was taken away for two years from my parents. And he said to me, that's how we know mom loves you more. <laughs> because she couldn't stand being me being taken away for more than a few months. But don't feel, don't feel too bad for him. You know, he did go on to Harvard, eventually, and Stanford, which is what you're supposed to do when you're Asian. <laughs> Anything less is like the Asian F, otherwise known as a B plus. And I've gotten a lot of B pluses in my life. <laughs> but um, talking about being a refugee, it's, it's not all bad, because being a refugee gave me the requisite emotional damage necessary to become a writer. <laughs> Something I, I try to pass on to my, to my now five-year-old son. <laughs> like most five-year-olds, he really loves Legos. But you know you can't give a kid everything he wants, so sometimes I have to tell him, no, you can't have those Legos. And I ask him, do you know why you're not getting those Legos? And he says, because you're a refugee? I say, that's absolutely right. <laughs> I want him to grow up knowing that his parents are refugees, that his grandparents are refugees. I want him to have some sense of the fact that we live in a world in which 66 million people are officially categorized by the United Nations as displaced persons, which is about the same size as the population of France. About 22 million of those people are officially classified as refugees. Now, refugees are not the same as immigrants. They overlap with immigrants, but they're not the same. And I think one of the key reasons, one of the key differences between refugees and immigrants is that refugees are unwanted where they come from and unwanted where they come to. And refugees know that. Recently, I went to speak at a high school in Boise, which had a refugee program. And I was told in advance I'm going to speak to these high school students, and a lot of them are refugees. So I asked them, how many of you here are refugees? And almost none of them raised their hands. So then I asked them, how many of you are immigrants? And then they started 
to raise their hands. They already knew that to be a refugee in this society is to be stigmatized. So that's why it's important for someone like me who is a refugee to stand up and to say, I am still a refugee. Because it is important for those of us who were unwanted to always remember what that experience is like and to stand up in solidarity with the people who are unwanted today. So much of my work has been about talking about refugees because it's my personal history, but it's also my belief that the refugee experience that was so important to me 40 years ago is still important today. And when we, spot, when we talk about the refugee crisis that we're undergoing today, we have to recognize that that refugee crisis is going to continue and to get worse in the future. And that the refugee experience has always been tied to the experience of war. So when I wrote The Sympathizer, when I wrote it, it as a war novel, but it was also a refugee novel. And that's the first thing I'm gonna to read to you tonight. What happens in The Sympathizer, for those of you who haven't read it, shame on you, <laughs> but what happens in The Sympathizer is that our protagonist is a communist spy in the South Vietnamese army, and when Saigon falls, or is liberated, depending on your point of view, his mission is to flee with the remnants of that army to the United States and spy on their efforts to take their country back. And in order to do that, he has to become a refugee. And so this scene is set in the much more glamorous refugee camp of Camp Pendleton, Southern California. And here he's writing a letter to his aunt in Paris describing what life is like in a refugee camp. If allowed to stay together, I told my aunt, we could have incorporated ourselves into a respectably sized, self-sufficient colony, a pimple on the buttocks of the American body politic, sufficiently collective to elect our own representative to the Congress and have a voice in our America, a little Saigon as delightful, delirious, and dysfunctional as the original, which was exactly why we were not allowed to stay together, but were instead dispersed by bureaucratic fiat. Wherever we found ourselves, we found each other. We did our best to conjure up the culinary staples of our culture, but since we were dependent on Chinese markets, our food had an unacceptably Chinese tinge. Another blow in the gauntlet of our humiliation that left us with the sweet and sour taste of unreliable memories, just correct enough to evoke the past, just wrong enough to remind us that the past was forever gone, missing, along with the proper variety, subtlety, and complexity of our universal solvent, fish sauce. <laughs> oh, fish sauce, how we missed it, how nothing tasted right without it. This pungent liquid condiment of the darkest sepia hue was much denigrated by foreigners for its supposedly horrendous reek lending new meaning to the phrase, there's something fishy around here. <laughs> For we were the fishy ones. We used fish sauce the way Transylvanian villagers wore cloves of garlic to ward off vampires, in our case to establish a perimeter with those Westerners who could never understand that what was truly fishy was the nauseating stench of cheese. <laughs> what was fermented fish compared to curdled milk. But out of deference to our hosts, we kept our feelings to ourselves, sitting close to one another on prickly sofas and scratchy carpets, our knees touching under crowded kitchen tables, chewing on dried squid and the cud of remembrance until our jaws ached, trading stories heard second and third hand about our scattered countrymen. This was the way we learned of the clan turned into slave labor by a farmer in Modesto and the naive girl who flew to Spokane to marry her GI sweetheart and was sold to a brothel and the widower with nine children who went out into a Minnesotan winter and lay down in the snow on his back with mouth open until he was buried and frozen and the regretful refugees on Guam who petitioned to go back to Vietnam never to be heard from again and the devout Buddhist who spanked his young son and was arrested for child abuse in Houston and the husband who slapped his wife and was jailed for domestic violence in Raleigh, and the men who had escaped but left wives behind in the chaos, and the women who had escaped but left husbands behind, and the children who had escaped without parents and grandparents, and the families missing one, two, three, or more children. <laughs> 
Sifting through the dirt, we pan for gold, the story of the baby orphan adopted by a Kansas billionaire, or the mechanic who bought a lottery ticket in Arlington and became a multi-millionaire, or the girl elected president of her high school class in Baton Rouge, or the boy accepted by the University of Michigan from Fond du Lac. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's actually Harvard in the original. <laughs> Or the movie star you love so much, dear aunt, who circled the world from airport to airport, no country letting her in after the fall of Saigon, none of her American movie star friends returning her desperate phone calls until, with her last dime, she snagged Tippi Hedren, who flew her to Hollywood. So it was that we soaped ourselves in sadness, and we rinsed ourselves with hope, and for all that we believed almost every rumor we heard, almost all of us refused to believe that our nation was dead. So the Tippi Hedren story is actually a true story. And the movie star was Giu Jin, who was the most famous Vietnamese movie star of the South in the 1960s and 70s. And Tippi Hedren uh, took such pity on the Vietnamese refugees that she encountered that she had her personal manicurist come to Camp Pendleton and train some of these women in the arts of manicuring which is how 50 years later, we Vietnamese people have come to take over 51% of the nail salon industry in this country. <laughs> True story. It's either a pro-refugee story or an anti-refugee story, depending on your point of view. I think it's a pro-refugee story. But I, 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 you know, I grew up vaguely sensing that there was, there was this difference between refugees and immigrants, and as time passed on, uh, the, that difference and that perception of who we are became clearer and clearer to me. And it became very clear around something called Hurricane Katrina. Now, some of these Vietnamese refugees in 1975 eventually ended up in Louisiana, right? and Hurricane Katrina happened. And tens of thousands of people were displaced, and this became a media spectacle. Some of the media called these displaced people refugees. And President Bush at the time said, it's un-American to call these people refugees. And for perhaps the only time in history, Jesse Jackson agreed with him. <laughs> A lot of these people were African Americans and Jesse Jackson said, it's racist to call African Americans refugees. And I thought, great, we refugees have succeeded in bringing America together in hating us. <laughs> it's un-American to call these people refugees. It's racist to call African Americans refugees. There's something about the American dream that's allergic to refugees. And I think that's because refugees bring with them this possibility that things can get very bad very quickly. And we're a country that believes that these things can't possibly happen to us. But that contamination that the refugees bring with them means that many refugees do their best to distance themselves from other refugees. And Vietnamese people are not exempt from this. Nowadays, there are former Vietnamese refugees going around saying, we should not accept any more refugees from places like Syria or the Middle East because we were the good refugees. These people are the bad refugees. Well, I grew up in San Jose, California, in a Vietnamese refugee community in the 1970s and 1980s. And I can tell you something. There were a lot of bad Vietnamese refugees <laughs> back then. Welfare fraud, insurance scams, cash under the table economies, we did all of that. We invented the home invasion. Okay. So there are a lot of bad Vietnamese refugees. And the problem, is in accepting this whole idea that there is such a thing as good refugees versus bad refugees or good immigrants versus bad immigrants. Because why were these bad Vietnamese refugees doing the bad things that they were doing? Perhaps they learned how to cheat welfare, cheat insurance from their experiences as Vietnamese people in a wartime economy in Vietnam that was completely corrupted by American aid. Perhaps they learned how to do home invasions and join gangs and become violent because of the extreme violence that they witnessed 
during the Vietnam War and that their fathers and their brothers and their uncles experienced as soldiers during the Vietnam War. And for all of those good Vietnamese refugees out there, you know who I mean, the ones who became doctors and lawyers and nurses and pharmacists and engineers, it's great for them. But what good are those good Vietnamese refugees doing? And I resist this whole idea of good and bad refugees or good and bad immigrants because what the outcome usually implies is that the only acceptable refugee or the only acceptable immigrant is the exceptional refugee, the exceptional immigrant, the ones who are going to win Pulitzer Prizes. But you can't admit more than one or two of those people, and I think that's exactly the intent behind this idea of good and bad refugees and good and bad immigrants. I, for one, believe in an America in which equality means the equal right to be mediocre, just like the average American. Yeah. Didn't really think that line was gonna get a lot of applause, but thank you for that. <laughs> and the idea of good refugees or good immigrants, that idea of superiority, of merit, is pernicious in ways that we don't really expect. And I'll give you an example from my own family's history. In 1978, my parents decided to move from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to San Jose, California in search of better opportunities. And in 1978, they opened perhaps the second Vietnamese grocery store in San Jose, California. This is what you're supposed to do when you're a good refugee or a good immigrant. You're supposed to pursue the American dream. And yet I remember as a kid walking down the street from my parents' store, I remember seeing a sign in another store window. And that sign said, another American driven out of business by the Vietnamese. And my 10-year-old self didn't really know what to do with that sign, didn't really understand that sign, except to know that it was directed against people like my parents, people like me. And it would take me decades to really understand that that sign really meant another American driven out of business by fill in the blank. Before us, there had been the Chinese, and after them, there had been the Japanese, and after them, there had been the Filipinos, and then it was the turn of the Vietnamese, and then it would be the Japanese again, and now it's the Chinese, and it's the North Koreans. It's an old, old story. And I wanted to take apart that story in the work that I do. And I'll read you a little bit from a book called Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War, where I talk about what this sign really means. As a gook in the eyes of some, I can testify that being remembered as the other is a dismembering experience, what we can call a disremembering. Disremembering is not simply the failure to remember. Disremembering is the unethical and paradoxical mode of forgetting at the same time as remembering. Or, from the perspective of the other who is disremembered, of being simultaneously seen and not seen. Disremembering allows someone to see right through the other, an experience rendered so memorably by Ralph Ellison in the opening pages of his novel, Invisible Man. His narrator, the hero, the titular hero, runs into a white man who refuses to see him and enraged strikes back to force the white man to see him. Even beaten, however, the white man refuses to see him the way he wishes to be seen. That is because the other's use of physical force may make the other visible, but only to turn him into a target. The other must deploy the psychic forces of remembering, imagining, and narrating if the other wishes to transform ways of seeing. Not satisfied with being disremembered, we who are others find that it is up to us to remember ourselves. Having carried ourselves over or been brought over from the other side, we gooks, we goo-goos, we slopes, we dinks, we zipper heads, we slant eyes, we yellow ones, we brown ones, we japs, we chinks, 
we ragheads, we sand niggers, we orientals, we who cannot be distinguished between ourselves because we all look alike. We know that the condition of our being and our self-representation is that we are both ourselves and others. We are never without identity and we are never without ideology, whether we like it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not. Those people who believe themselves to be beyond identity and ideology will, sooner or later, charge us with identity and ideology if we dare to commit that most unnatural act of speaking up and out. When I was growing up in, in San Jose, I had no idea that I was being disremembered. That sign, another American driven out of business by the Vietnamese is an act of disremembering because we were not being forgotten. We were not not being seen. We were being seen and we were being forgotten all at the same time. And I absorbed all of that. I internalized all of that. So that when I went to high school, I went to a very elite high school that was mostly white. But there were a handful of us who were of Asian descent. And we knew we were different in some way. We just, we, we just weren't able to articulate that. So every day at lunch, we would gather in a corner of the campus, and we would call ourselves the Asian Invasion. <laughs> it's a funny thing. Last year, I went back to that campus to give a speech, 30 years after I graduated, and we really have taken over. <laughs> but that is another story. So the Asian Invasion. Now, obviously, we knew that somehow we had all been brought there by war. And in my case, it was the Vietnam War. So I grew up knowing a little bit about, about this thing called the Vietnam War. But really, what I heard about often was Vietnam. And what I understood in retrospect is that when Americans say the word Vietnam, they really mean the Vietnam War. And when they say the Vietnam War, they really mean the American War. In other words, what the war meant to Americans, how the war affected Americans, how the war killed 58,000 plus Americans, which is a tragedy. But in remembering the war in that fashion, what Americans forgot were the three million Vietnamese people who died during that war. And what Americans and Vietnamese people forgot were the three million or so Laotians and Cambodians who also died during the years of the war and its aftermath. And it seems, it seems important to talk about this remembering and forgetting of war and its consequences on this day of 9-11 as we engage in the necessary act of remembering what has happened to this country and to the civilians who died during 9-11 and to the American soldiers who have died during the 17 years of war that have ensued and the war in which we are still embroiled. But what have we forgotten? Do we know how many other people have died during these 17 years of war? I don't think we do. The act of remembering always comes along with the act of forgetting. And for me, growing up in that Vietnamese refugee community, I was acutely aware of this problem of remembering and forgetting. I was acutely aware that Americans remembered Americans, but they did not remember people like my parents or other Vietnamese refugees. And in my work as a scholar and as a writer, I'm acutely aware of the fact that when we say the word war, usually we think of men, of soldiers, of battles, of tanks, of weaponry, but we don't think about civilians and women and children, and the fact that in the Vietnam War, more civilians died than soldiers did, which is absolutely typical of all the wars that were fought in the 20th century and typical of the wars that have been fought in this century as well. So I teach a class on the Vietnam War and I have my students go out and interview survivors of the Vietnam War and, and here's what they discover. They interview American veterans and they find out that some of these veterans have been through terrible experiences. They've killed people, they've seen their friends killed, they're traumatized. And they also find out that a lot of American veterans never saw any combat at all. They spent their tour on a ship or on a base not being shot at. But they interview Southeast Asian refugees and what they discover is that every single one of those refugees has a traumatic story to tell because that's what it took 
to flee their countries and to get to the United States. So my work in The Sympathizer and in Nothing Ever Dies and in The Refugees has been very much about talking about war in a way that brings up military and civilians, soldiers and refugees, men and women, and to get us to think about war as not simply an episode, right, but war as a continual experience. The Vietnam War for me is not important because it took place during 1965 to 1975. The Vietnam War is important to me because it is part of a much longer history of warfare. If we talk about Vietnam, it, Vietnam has been at war for hundreds of years. If we talk about the United States, the Vietnam War was simply another episode and an expansion of the United States that began from the very first moment that settlers landed here in this country and expanded through the West and the Philippines and Guam and Puerto Rico and Hawaii and Cuba and Korea and eventually to Vietnam and now to the Middle East as well. And in my work, I think about something that I wrote about in Nothing Ever Dies, that all wars are fought twice, the first time on the battlefield, the second time in memory. That's certainly true for the Vietnam War. I grew up in this Vietnamese refugee community surrounded by Vietnamese refugees for whom the war had never ended, simply because somebody had declared the war to be over in 1975 didn't mean the war was actually over for them. They lived lives that were saturated by loss, by sadness, by anger, by rage, by melancholy, and the only people to whom they could tell their stories were to each other and to their children because the rest of America didn't want to hear these kinds of stories. And at the same time, I was hearing all of these stories and absorbing all of these emotions, and I was watching American movies about the Vietnam War. Because in the 1970s and the 1980s and into the 1990s and even into the 2000s, America was fighting the war again and again on film. And at a much too young of an age, I watched a movie called Apocalypse Now. It was about 1980, 1981. My parents brought home this newfangled invention called the VCR. For those of you who are college students, you have no idea what I'm talking about. This was a box into which you could put another box and you could watch exactly one movie. So after I watched Star Wars about a dozen times, I watched Apocalypse Now. And I was a kid who was completely into war. I was a war junkie. I loved American war movies, loved cheering for John Wayne. And as I was watching Apocalypse Now, I was cheering for American soldiers. I was identifying with Americans up until the point they killed Vietnamese civilians in a massacre. And at that moment, I felt myself split in two. Was I the American doing the killing or was I the Vietnamese being killed? And I didn't realize how deeply affected I was by this until later on when I was in college and I recounted this scene to a classroom of my, of my fellow students, and I found myself shaking in rage and anger. And I realized at that point, again, how powerful stories are. That stories can empower us and stories can destroy us at the same time. And that's one of the reasons why I became a writer. So when it came time to writing The Sympathizer, I couldn't help myself. I needed to take revenge on Hollywood. <laughs> so soon after he leaves the refugee camp, my narrator finds a job as the authenticity consultant on the making of a movie that looks suspiciously like Apocalypse Now. <laughs> but if Francis Ford Coppola or his lawyers are to ask, is not Apocalypse Now. <laughs> so in this scene, um, he meets the, uh, the famous director uh, who is known only as the auteur and he's already read the screenplay and he's given the auteur notes on the screenplay and they're gonna be talking about it. And the screenplay, by the way, is for a movie called The Hamlet. And it's about American Green Berets who are sent to Vietnam to train the ethnic minorities to fight back against communism and these ethnic minorities are called the Montagnards. My meeting with the auteur had gone on for a while longer, mostly in a more subdued fashion, with me pointing out that the lack of speaking parts for Vietnamese people in a movie set in Vietnam might be interpreted as cultural insensitivity. Do you not think it would be a little more believable, I said, a little more realistic, 
a little more authentic for a movie set in a certain country for the people in that country to have something to say? Instead of having your screenplay direct, as it does now, cut to villagers speaking in their own language. Do you think it might not be decent to let them actually say something? Instead of simply acknowledging that there is some kind of sound coming from their mouths? Could you not even just have them speak a heavily accented English? You know what I mean, ching chong English? Just to pretend that they're speaking in an Asian language that somehow American audiences can strangely understand? The auteur grimaced and said, very interesting, great stuff, loved it. But I had a question, what was it? Oh yes, how many movies have you made? None, isn't that right? None, zero, zilch, nada, nothing, and however you say it, in your language. So thank you for telling me how to do my job. Now get the hell out of my house and come back after you've made a movie or two. Maybe then I'll listen to one or two of your cheap ideas. You know, since the book came out, I've had the chance to speak to a few Hollywood people, <laughs> and none of them dispute this characterization. <laughs> I confess to being angry with the auteur but was I wrong in being angry? This was especially the case when he acknowledged he did not even know that Montagnard was simply a French catch-all term for the dozens of Highland minorities. What if, I said to him, I wrote a screenplay about the American West and simply called all the natives Indians. You'd wanna know whether the cavalry was fighting the Navajo or Apache or Comanche, right? Likewise, I would wanna know when you say these people are Montagnards, whether we speak of the brew, or the nung, or the tay. Let me tell you a secret, the auteur said. You ready? Here it is. No one gives a shit. He was amused by my wordlessness. To see me without words is like seeing one of those Egyptian felines without hair, a rare and not necessarily desirable occasion. How could I be so dense? How could I be so deluded? I naively believed that I could divert the Hollywood organism from its goal, the simultaneous lobotomization and pickpocketing of the world's audiences. Hollywood did not just make horror movie monsters, it was its own horror movie monster, smashing me under its foot. I had failed and the auteur would make the Hamlet as he intended, with my countrymen serving merely as raw material for an epic about white men saving good yellow people from bad yellow people. I pitied the French for their naivete in believing they had to visit a country in order to exploit it. Hollywood was much more efficient imagining the countries it wanted to exploit. I was maddened by my helplessness before the auteur's imagination and machinations. His arrogance marked something new in the world, for this was the first war where the losers would write history instead of the victors courtesy of the most efficient propaganda machine ever created, with all due respect to Joseph Goebbels and the Nazis who never achieved global domination. Hollywood's high priests understood innately the observation of Milton's Satan, that it was better to rule in hell than serve in heaven, better to be villain, loser, or anti-hero than virtuous extra, so long as one commanded the bright lights of center stage. In this forthcoming Hollywood Trump lay, all the Vietnamese of any side would come out poorly, herded into the roles of the poor, the innocent, the evil, or the corrupt. Our fate was not to be merely mute. We were to be struck dumb. Well, soon after the novel came out, um, I received a review, which was a great review, in the New York Times, which did something that I, was, that I knew was gonna happen. And that was in the second or third line of the review, the, the reviewer said, Viet is the voice for the voiceless. And I was like, no! Have you ever met any Vietnamese people? <laughs> Been to a Vietnamese restaurant? Been to Vietnam itself? We're really, really loud. <laughs> the problem is not that we're voiceless. 
The problem is that we're not heard. And that's a dilemma that we're in, all of us who are minorities of, of one kind or another. We all have voices. But do we get heard? Do we get access to the means of representation and the means of production that would allow our stories to be told? And when I hear that I'm the voice for the voiceless, I actually don't hear a compliment. What I hear is the desire to hear just one voice. Instead of wanting to hear the chorus or the cacophony of Vietnamese voices, people just want to hear one voice. And that is a dangerous situation to be in. For me, justice when it comes to stories is not about elevating people into becoming voices for the voiceless. Justice is about creating a society in which all voices are heard, in which all voices can be turned into stories, where everyone has access to telling those stories. And we are a far cry from being a society in which that justice has been achieved. And when I was in high school, calling myself a part of this Asian invasion, what I didn't understand was that I was in need of more voices. I was in need of more stories from people like me. I was in need of more immigrant stories, more refugee stories, more Asian American stories. I didn't understand that I was living at a time of narrative scarcity where there weren't enough stories. And looking back, of course, I can say that it was structural racism that was responsible for this narrative scarcity. But you know who else was responsible? Asian parents. <laughs> Asian parents, or those of you who are about to become Asian parents, you've got to do better. Don't bury the dreams of your artistic children, those people who want to tell stories and to raise up their voices. Nurture them, grow them, encourage them, so that one day they too will become writers who will write scathing autobiographies featuring you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Asian parents, at least my Asian parents, have been through a lot. They've been through so much. And when I was growing up, I, I, I knew that we were, my parents and other Vietnamese refugees were haunted by their past, by everything that they had been through, everything that they had been able to tell me, and everything that they would never tell me about what they had been through. And so when I wrote The Refugees, I was very much thinking about what it meant to be haunted, what it meant to be living with ghosts, and that one of the defining experiences of all refugees, whether we're Vietnamese or of some other background, is that all of us have been haunted, all of us are haunted by our past and by the people that we have left behind. I'm just gonna read you, the last thing I'm gonna read you is just the opening pages of the first story, Black Eyed Women. Fame would strike someone usually the kind that healthy-minded people would not wish upon themselves, such as being kidnapped and kept prisoner for years, humiliated in a sex scandal, or surviving something typically fatal. These survivors needed someone to help write their memoirs, and their agents might eventually come across me. At least your name's not on anything, my mother once said. When I mentioned that I would not mind being thanked in the acknowledgments, she said, let me tell you a story. It would be the first time I heard this story, but not the last. In our homeland, she went on, there was a reporter who said the government tortured the people in prison. So the government does to him exactly what he said they did to others. They send him away and no one ever sees him again. That's what happens to writers who put their names on things. By the time Victor Devoto chose me, I had resigned myself to being one of those writers whose names did not appear on book covers. His agent had given him a book that I had ghostwritten. It's ostensible author, the father of a boy who had shot and killed several people at his school. I identify with the father's guilt, Victor said to me. He was the sole survivor of an airplane crash, 173 others having perished, including his wife and children. What was left of him appeared on all the talk shows, his body there, 
but not much else. The voice was a soft monotone, and the eyes on the occasions they looked up seemed to hold within them the silhouettes of mournful people. His publisher said that it was urgent that he finish his story while audiences still remembered the tragedy, and this was my preoccupation on the day my dead brother returned to me. My mother woke me while it was still dark outside and said, don't be afraid. Through my open door, the light from the hallway stung. Why would I be afraid? When she said my brother's name, I did not think of my brother. He had died long ago. I closed my eyes and said, I did not know anyone by that name, but she persisted. He's here to see us, she said, stripping off my covers and tugging at me until I rose, eyes half shut. She was 63, moderately forgetful, and when she led me to the living room and cried out, I was not surprised. He was right here, she said, kneeling by her floral armchair as she felt the carpet. It's wet. She crawled to the front door in her cotton pajamas following the trail. When I touched the carpet, it was damp. For a moment, I twitched in belief, and the silence of the house at four in the morning felt ominous. Then I noticed the sound of rainwater in the gutters, and the fear that had gripped my neck relaxed its hold. My mother must have opened the door, gotten drenched, then come back inside. I knelt by her as she crouched next to the door, her hand on the knob, and said, you're imagining things. I know what I saw. Brushing my hand off her, shoulder, off her shoulder, she stood up, anger illuminating her dark eyes. He walked. He talked. He wanted to see you. Then where is he, Ma? I don't see anyone. Of course you don't, she sighed, as if I were the one unable to grasp the obvious. He's a ghost, isn't he? I grew up feeling like I was surrounded by ghosts. I grew up with a photograph of a young woman who was my sister. So we had fled Vietnam, but we had left her behind. I was too young to remember her. But there was this black and white photograph that my father had managed to carry with him of a 16-year-old girl. I knew her name. I had no idea who she was. And I grew up with that absent presence in my life and in my family. To me, that was a ghost. That was a haunting within our own family. And our family was like every other Vietnamese refugee. What we had been through, the people we had left behind, the people we had lost, the country that we had lost, all of those experiences were shared by every other Vietnamese refugee. I knew we were haunted. What I didn't know was that we would also haunt this country as well. That also comes from my family experience. My parents, when they opened that, that grocery store in 1978, they would run that grocery store for 15 years. It would nearly kill them. They were shot in that store on Christmas Eve. So when I saw that sign, another American driven out of business by the Vietnamese, I wondered, does that person know this is what has happened to my parents? Does that person know what they have been through to become the people that they are and to get to this country? Of course that person didn't know that. That person didn't see my parents as human. Well, eventually what happened to that store was that the city of San Jose thought it would be a great idea to build the brand new City Hall of San Jose directly across the street from my parents' store. And they thought it would be a great idea to buy my parents' property, to force my parents to sell their property so they could build a symphony hall on top of my parents' property. And I was bitter about that. Not about the money. I was bitter about the fact that everything that my parents had been through, which was symbolized in that grocery store, the fact that they worked there 12 to 14 hour days, every day of the year, for my brother and for me and for all the relatives in Vietnam that they were sending money home to, to keep them alive during the years of starvation in the 1970s and the 1980s, all of that 
was erased from the landscape. And not just my parents, but all of the Vietnamese refugee businesses in downtown San Jose that were there, they were erased too because Despite what that sign said, the only people during that time period who wanted to open stores in downtown San Jose, which was a very rough neighborhood, were the Vietnamese refugees. And if you go to downtown San Jose today, you will see no sign of those Vietnamese refugee businesses. So I was bitter. And for years and years, whenever I returned to San Jose, I would never go back to that street where my parents' store was. Until one day, after the Pulitzer Prize, San Jose City Hall thought it would be a great idea to give me a commendation. So I said yes. And I went back to San Jose City Hall and I told them the exact same story I'm telling you today. But the funny thing is, is that throughout all those years, what I thought had happened was that the city had never built Symphony Hall. What I thought, what, what they had built instead was a parking garage. And so I finally went back and parked underneath City Hall and came out and looked across the street to where my parents' store had been, and I realized they had not even built a parking garage. They had built a parking lot. And there's a line from the sympathizer that goes, America's greatest architectural contribution to the world is the parking lot. So it felt very, very appropriate. But we had been erased from that landscape. But I couldn't help but feel that we haunted that landscape as well. And that's why I became a writer. To do justice to those, to those memories. To do justice to those stories. And to recognize that that sign, another American driven out of business by the Vietnamese, is not just a sign. It's a story. It's a story told in nine words that is an incredibly powerful story. And the reason why it's an incredibly powerful story is that it's not just told by professional storytellers like me. It's a story that's told by politicians. It's a story that's told by everyday people as they go about their business. It's a story that has circulated over and over and over again so that eventually people come to believe it, so much so that they can write that sign and put it in their shop window. It's an old story that's being told again today. We are no longer living in the 1970s and the 1980s. We are no longer living in that same age of narrative scarcity that I experienced as a refugee. There are more and more people like me, before me, like me now, who are writing these kinds of stories, who are fighting against narrative scarcity, who are fighting against the erasure of refugees and immigrants and minorities and Asian Americans and people of color in this country. But we don't yet have narrative plenitude either. We know we will have narrative plenitude when another story by an Asian American or a refugee or an immigrant is something neither to be celebrated or something to be anxious about. We know we will have reached narrative plenitude when we no longer need voices for the voiceless because all of us will have voices, all of us will be heard. But in order to do that, we have to change this country, we have to change the society, we have to change how stories are told. We need to tell stories about America that build bridges instead of building walls. We need to tell stories about opening our hearts instead of closing our minds. And we have to tell those stories every day to ourselves, to others, to anybody who will listen. You and me, in this sense, we are all storytellers of our own stories and of America's as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. about 15 minutes for Q&A, question and answer. Uh, I'd like to call upon our volunteers from the United Asian American Organizations, UAAO, to grab the mics. And if you have a question and you're in the balcony, if you could come down, because the mics can't go up there. So if you want to ask a question and you're in the balcony, come down to 
the main floor. And if you um, want your book signed, there will be a book signing right after the Q&A. So can we have the folks go into the audience? OK. So we'll have time for a couple questions. If you want to go in. If you have a question, if you could raise your hand. And we'll have the mic come to you. If you're in the balcony, you have to come downstairs to ask the question, please. And perhaps say your name and your affiliation. Okay. Hi there. It's probably unprintable and unspeakable what I actually thought in my mind at that point. But I thought, I, thought, I mean, let me, let me just say that um, uh, I, I've been rejected a lot in my life. And in general, that's a good thing. It builds character. You know, if, if, I, if I had been accepted, right, I mean, if I, if I actually had gone to Harvard, I'd probably be an insufferable human being right now, you know. Um, but I went to my last choice college, and it really, you know, motivated me to work really hard to get to my first choice college, which was UC Berkeley. And all of those rejections for, as a writer over time, literally hundreds of rejections, and, and seeing the sympathizer rejected by, you know, 13 of the best editors in, in New York City, all of that was actually good, I think, because what it really helped me to think about uh, was that phrase that, that Emily brought up, defiant humility. You know, when you've been rejected a lot and then you finally get accepted or win awards, the last thing you should do is to think, I'm awesome. You know, the last, I, 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 what you should do is to think, well, uh, I, I've worked to get this thing, to get this publication or to get this award and so on, but I've done it through, for the sake of something greater than the publication or the award. Those things are just human vanities, right? And they're really dangerous. You know, getting, getting, getting the Pulitzer Prize is like getting a plate full of cocaine for your ego, you know? Uh, it's really tempting to just suck it all up. Not a good thing to do. So getting rejected was really good because in the end, by the time I got around to writing The Sympathizer, I really understood that I was not doing it for the publication and, and for the awards, even though all that stuff is nice. I was doing it for the art for the for the writing, and I think that's true for no matter what we what we do. I mean, I, I know I've, I've I've kidded people who are doctors and lawyers and pharmacists and all that kind of stuff, but you know, hopefully, whatever you do, you do it because you care about the act itself, not about the money or the recognition or the prestige or anything of that sort. And so that's what rejection was good for. That's what 20 years of working in obscurity was good for. This affirmation, this confirmation in my own self that in the end I was doing it for the sake of the writing itself. There's one there, and there's one there. So there's, you know, there's one there, and then did I see one over there? So maybe we could have one mic over there, and then the next mic. Can you? Yeah. There's actually two on that side. So. Um, hi, I'm Adina. I'm here right now because I'm taking a class with uh, Professor Emily Lawson. And I was, uh, I wanted to ask you a question about what it feels like to understand everything that your parents sacrificed. Because for me, knowing all the things my parents had to go through to bring me here, I feel a lot of guilt. And I feel like they have um, some license over choosing what I do. But clearly, you kind of probably went off uh, the usual path of you know being a doctor or being a lawyer. So I was wondering how you felt about um, maybe that guilt of knowing what your parents sacrificed and how you dealt with that. And let me just add that I'm also a Catholic, so the guilt is compounded, okay? It's multiplied, it's squared. Um, and I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, it's, it's again, I, 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 I joke about the doctors and the lawyers, but I really feel for them. I mean, if you really want to become a doctor and a lawyer, that's awesome, but if you're doing it because your parents are making you do it or you feel really guilty, it's a horrible situation to be in. And I knew many, many, many people at Berkeley who were in that situation. Um, there's no easy answer to that because the guilt is, is, is warranted. You know, for, for many of us, our parents really did sacrifice an enormous amount to get to this country, and then when they got to this country, to, to work at jobs they may not have wanted to work at, and so on. So we owe them a lot. Do we owe them our lives? Maybe, because they, 
you know, sacrifice their lives for us too. That's a huge burden to bear. And I think um, the way I, I dealt with that, well, number one, I got very lucky because my parents proved to, who are very conservative, proved to be liberal on one point only, which is that they said, okay, well, we understand you don't want to be a medical doctor, but you're still going to get a doctorate, right? <laughs> okay, that's sort of close enough, right? Um, so they were okay with me getting, <laughs> getting a doctorate in English, even though they had no idea what that meant. Um, but the way I dealt with it was, was the way they probably dealt with me, which is I didn't tell them the entire truth. Isn't that right? Like I said, my parents have told me certain stories about their past, some of which are really horrible, but I'm sure they, have told me, they haven't told me everything. Maybe they're withholding things from me. And likewise, I withhold things from them all the time. This is how you survive as an Asian, isn't it? Like, you don't tell the whole truth. You don't have to lie. You don't have to tell the whole truth, you know? And so that's what happened. I, 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 for me, it was that, uh, for me, the, my day job was to be a professor. My fantasy was to be the writer, which I never told them about, okay? And so if you become a doctor or a lawyer, that's, that's a huge day job already. But don't give up your, your uh, if you have other dreams and other fantasies, don't give that up. You know, I mean, actually, the worst possible example I can think of are, are, those, are those Asian American doctors who also became writers. That's really horrible. You know, you're setting a bar that's way too high for the rest of us. Um, but uh, and that, that's why I was only half joking about the Asian parents thing. You know, we, we who have been subjected to that by our Asian parents, don't do that to our own kids. You know, recognize that uh, whatever we've been through is not something that we need to repeat again for the next generation. And as for us, we're left with the difficult task of trying to negotiate between our parents' expectations, our own personal desires, and it's, 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 a, it's a huge burden, but it's not, one way to put it into context is to realize it's not any heavier of a burden than our parents carried. Hi, my name is Hannah. I'm a junior at Michigan studying communications and creative writing. And I've talked about this book in actually a couple of my classes. Um, so my question comes in two parts. It's interesting because the last time I talked about this book in a class, it was about war and popular culture. We talked a lot about how especially the American sides of wars are very interesting because there's been very few wars fought on the American front. And pretty much everyone in America knows it basically from the media. So I think it's very interesting that you critiqued Hollywood in The Sympathizer. And my question would be, one, did you go into writing the book with the influence of public opinion or wanting to change how Americans view the war, dealing with the Vietnam syndrome, and maybe being more averse to going into future conflicts? And two, if you were approached to make a movie about The Sympathizer from Hollywood, how would you react? Would you want to take advantage of that platform and continue spreading the story, or would you be afraid of it being twisted into something that it's not? <laughs> I think my dream scenario was always that you know Francis Ford Coppola or Sofia Coppola would buy the rights to the novel and just screw me, you know, completely. I'd just be poetic justice. I could write another novel about that. Um, so I'll, I'll answer your, your questions in sequence. And yes, in, you know, I think that again, for me to become a writer and to become a scholar too, there was always this ambition that I wanted to try to change the story. That's, you know, that's partly what the talk was about, changing the story. And of course, I, I got really, really lucky and I won the Pulitzer Prize and therefore more people are going to read it. But regardless of that, the ambition was always, and this is, you know, always to try to make an intervention, to do in my own little way, put out a story that would challenge some fundamental American notions of, of what the Vietnam War was, what it means to be an American, and, and so on. And I think that for me, that was the only only reason why I could imagine myself even becoming a scholar and then a writer, okay? Because imagine, you know, I was studying English literature. There was no way I was going to go home to my refugee parents who were working these 12 to 14 hour days and say, hey, mom and dad, I, I really want to spend my life studying the romantic poets. No one's going to happen. So I had to find a way to make the act of writing, of scholarship, something meaningful for me beyond only the aesthetic. And that was what was so great about Emily's introduction. It was exactly this, uh, this, this confrontation with Asian American and with ethnic studies when I was an undergraduate that transformed me and convinced me that stories could also have political meanings as well. And that the act of storytelling was, again, something that we engaged in as writers all the time, but that the act of storytelling would influence people who were not storytellers. Right? So that I was influenced by what Francis Ford Coppola was imagining when I was 10 years old. 
So that that would be something that I would try to intervene in when I would become a writer uh, too. And so then, yes, I have been approached uh, by, by you know, various people about making this novel into a, a movie or, or a television series. And I wanted to do a television series. And the first time we tried to go out there and, and, pit, and you know, I had a producer who was, who was a very successful producer. And, and this was a producer whose work you would all know. And this is a producer who was down with the various kinds of issues that I raised in my talk. But she went out there to try to sell the sympathizer as, as a TV series. And she came back and she said, well, you know, uh, unless we get Keanu Reeves on board, it's not gonna happen. And, and this, this, this was about a year and a half or two years ago. And I, I, and, and, and I thought, I, I wasn't offended enough at the time, but now I'm, now I'm offended. Because we were, we were thinking about something like, 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 um, like um, Narcos, okay? Now Narcos is a 30 to $40 million a year uh, season show. And it has no movie stars in it. But somehow for Asian Americans or for Vietnamese people, we have to have Keanu Reeves in order to justify that budget. That's what we were up against. And then Crazy Rich Asians changed everything. I mean, literally after Crazy Rich Asian success, my agent said, everybody's, you know, people are calling now. You know, Leo DiCaprio's agency is calling now. You know, like this, this, this. And so um, that is what we mean by, by narrative uh, plenitude, that regardless of whether Crazy Rich Asians is a good movie or a bad movie, and I confess, I haven't had the time to even watch it yet, it doesn't make any difference. You know, Hollywood is putting out crappy movies all the time. We have to have the right to put out crappy movies too. <laughs> You know? and so that's what we mean by narrative plenitude. Out of, out of that morass of mediocre movies, something great will come, and I hope to be able to participate in that. <laughs> Time for maybe one or two more questions. I, thought I saw someone up there. They're up there? Oh, there's one there, and then I think there's one over there. There's one right there, and then there's one in the back. So this gentleman will go here? Yeah. Hi, okay. so, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm also in a field where I want to do storytelling, um, in, like, on the silver screen, actually. Okay. And um, I think as long as, like, I remember, I've had this thought and, like, been painfully aware that there's less representation for Asian Americans in um, just the media, and, like, whether it's TV shows or movies. And I think that also stems from this studio concern of not, people not being, like, interested in, like, the Asian American stories. So I th my question to you is, um, What's the balance that we should strike of making our media palatable versus like authentic? Oh, what's the balance between palatable and... Um, well, you know what? There is no balance. There is no balance. Uh, I, I think that that's always been... Okay, look, if you're going to make Crazy Rich Asians, I'm just going to use that example because you've all heard of it. Of course they had to strike a balance. You know, they, they're, they're, they have a certain kind of strategy. They want to reach a mass market audience, etc. But at the same time, they also wanted to tell a certain kind of Asian American story that they felt would be authentic to people who were Asian Americans. Not necessarily to Asians in Asia, but to Asian Americans, right? And so that's always the, 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 the balance that, that we need to talk about. Uh, how, what, is, what is the scope of your ambition? What is the nature of your project? And how authentic do you want that to be? And there's no singular answer that I can give you. you know, so with, when I wrote The Sympathizer, for example, my ambition in, in my own head was that I would not try to make it palatable. I would not try to think about reaching a white audience or a majority audience, whatever that happens to be. I would write a book for myself, first and foremost. And that, I think, is something that everybody who's a writer, who's an artist, has to get to at some point, you know, when you're learning how to, you're learning your craft and so on, you're plagued by all kinds of anxieties, you're worried about whether you're gonna get published or whether you're gonna be staged or filmed and so on. And so you're anxious about how other people are regarding your work, you're anxious about whether your work is palatable. If you do that, if you give in to that anxiety and you worry about the palatability, you're, you, the odds of you producing a work that is really meaningful, really significant, really authentic to your own vision is gonna be deeply compromised, right? And so that was why it was important for the sympathizer, for me in writing that novel, to be in that psychic mode of thinking, it's for me first and foremost. And then after that, I can think about other audiences. And then I can think about the question of palatable. But palatable was never, for me, about holding back politically or holding back culturally. So they're all, you know, writing a, writing a scene in which I'm gonna compare Hollywood and say that it's worse than the Nazis, 
That's not something that it would be very palatable by many people's standards. But how the novel is palatable is that it's written at a certain kind of artistic level in my, from my perception. And I think that's where the real palatability needs to be addressed. When we see Crazy Rich Asians, uh, the question of palatability is about does it execute the genre in which it works well? Is it a well done film? That's really where the question of palatability is. It shouldn't be about, well, let's not, let's not put in fish sauce because it might confuse people or offend people. No, that stuff needs to be put in. But how do you do it? How do you do it artfully? That's, the, that's really where the question of palatability comes up. Do we have time for one more question? Or, or two? Okay, go ahead. And if you put the mic right to your mouth, yes. please. Uh, yes, hi, my name is Stephen, I'm an MBA alum. I uh, just had a, a question, we talked a little bit about Hollywood, and I guess I'm just going to keep it going here. If, if there were uh, any movies about Vietnam that you liked, maybe Good Morning Vietnam, and, and, and even recent documentaries, Ken Burns is an Ann Arbor native, I don't know if you saw any of the Vietnam War documentary, and, and I'm just uh, related, you know, which did involve a number of Vietnamese uh, people, you know, with subtitles, et cetera, and just related to that, you mentioned your, your uh, Catholic faith. I was just wondering how the... You know, because in, in that documentary, I was, I guess I really learned about the Catholic versus Buddhist thing in South Vietnam. And I was wondering how that uh, affected the refugee, the Vietnamese refugee community. Well, the Catholic question is, is, a, is an interesting one because it goes to the core of, uh, of the Vietnam War history and what happened to the Vietnamese people. You know, my parents were actually Catholics in North Vietnam. Um, and in 1954, when the country was divided into two, um, a million or so. North Vietnamese Catholics migrated south because they were afraid of communism. And this was partly manipulated by, by the CIA. And then these Vietnamese Catholics in the south formed the power base for President Ngo Dinh Diem, who was basically, you know, the, the president that the Americans wanted because he was a Catholic and at least the Americans at the time thought he would do what the Americans wanted them to do. He didn't do what the Americans wanted him to do and so the Americans had him assassinated. Okay, that's in the novel and it's really what happened. Uh, but that, that experience then obviously is tied in with the war and the fact that the Vietnamese Catholics are a minority but they held outsized power for in the 1950s and the 1960s meant that there would be a lot of religious tension tied in with political tensions during the course of the war. And even today, of course, to be in the years after the war and up until today, to be a Catholic in Vietnam is to be a part of a persecuted, discriminated against minority. Um, the question of whether there are any American films about the Vietnam War that I like, well, I like Apocalypse now, don't get me wrong. You know, you should see how I talk about films I don't like, but I like Apocalypse now. That doesn't mean that I can't be critical of it. I think it's a great work of art that's also a racist work of art, you know. Uh, th these two things are completely compatible. So I like Full Metal Jacket, I like The Deer Hunter, or, you know, I don't like Rambo. Okay, that's just a piece of trash, but... It, <laughs> The, 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 the so-called classics of America cinema about the Vietnam War are actually technically really good movies, but they are all racist and sexist when it comes to depicting Vietnamese people and Vietnamese women. Okay, that's just part and parcel of what's happening. Um, the films that I actually tend to, to, be, to be more effusive about are the smaller films, like a documentary, like um, In the Year of the Pig by Emilio D'Antonio. Uh, which actually influenced Apocalypse Now. I think it's a great documentary, for example. And when it comes to Ken Burns' film, and remember, he did it with, in partnership with Lynn Novick, who, as far as I can tell, did a huge amount of work on the film, but it becomes a Ken Burns-branded film instead. But when Lynn, Lynn Novick, I actually met. You know, she's a fan of the novel, and she invited me to the studio when they were editing uh, the documentary, and they showed me um, 45 minutes of clips and I thought it was beautiful. I thought the clips that I saw were beautiful and, and they, I think they were very careful to show me a lot of clips featuring North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese voices. Um, but I have never seen the whole 18 hour documentary because I don't have 18 hours to spare to watch in a documentary. And because I knew when it came out that if I watched all 18 hours of, a doc, of that documentary, I would be called upon as the professional Vietnamese to give my opinion on radio and talk shows about that documentary. That's what happened. People were calling me up and saying, hey, do you want to come talk about it? And I could honestly say, I haven't seen it yet. You know? And I knew that when I, would go, when I was on the tour talking to audiences like this, in the three or four months after that documentary came out, I knew 
and this is exactly what happened, there would always be someone in the audience who would ask me, have you seen the Ken Burns documentary about the Vietnam War? And inevitably that person had never read a book or seen a movie by any Vietnamese person. And if you've got 18 hours to spare to watch a Ken Burns documentary about the Vietnam War or any other American production about the Vietnam War, you have time to read at least one book and watch at least one movie by a Vietnamese person. <laughs> Sorry, I got excited. <laughs> Give it up for Ben. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, Santa Arbor. Thank you. Wow. Oh, before you go, we're going to call up. This took a lot of work to bring all these collaborators together. We're going to bring up the student volunteers from United Asian American Organizations Christian Pineda. Kathy Wu and Dim Mang to give us our thank yous. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Christian Panetta and I am one of the co-chairs for the United Asian American Organizations or UAAO. My name is Kathy Wu, I'm also one of the co-chairs of the United Asian American Organizations. I'm Dim Mong and I'm the president of Beta Alpha Rho Pre-Law and Public Service Fraternity and one of the co-external chairs of UAAO. So on behalf of the United Asian American Organizations, we would like to thank you all for attending this event. Again, we would like to thank Dr. Viet Tung Nguyen for coming to the University of Michigan for delivering a reading of his work in addition to his insights. We would like to take this time to thank our sponsors for the event. First, our major sponsors, the Helen Zell Writers Program, the Department of English Literature and Language, the College of Literature, Science and Arts Office of the Associate Dean for the Humanities, Ann Curzan, the LSA Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Fiona Lee. We're also immensely thankful to our co-sponsors, Lynn Song and Doug Song, without whom this event would not have been possible. We want to thank them for their indispensable support, and we hope to work with them again in the future. Along with Lynn Song and Doug Song, we'd like to thank the Asian Pacific Islander American Studies Program, the International Institute, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, Vietnamese Studies, Border Collective Rackham Interdisciplinary Workshop, the Department of Anthropology, the Department of History, the Department of American Culture, the Arab and Muslim American Studies, Residential College, the Department of Asian Languages and Culture, and the Office of Multi-Ethnic Student Affairs, especially Abby Chen. We would also like to thank the Asian Pacific American Law Students Association, the United Asian American Organizations, Alpha Delta Kelta Phi Sorority, Beta Alpha Rho Pre-Law and Public Service Fraternity, the Vietnamese Student Association, and our organizers, Emily P. Lawson, Deb Doug Trevor, the director of the Helen Zell Writers Program, Maya West, Olivia Moore, Jane Johnson, and Jeremy Mitchell, the English department staff. Lastly, UAO has a couple of announcements. Our first bi-weekly programming begins tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. in the Yuri Kochiyama Lounge in South Quad. Tomorrow's meeting will include what UAO has in store for the year and is a great chance to meet individuals from our member organizations. Uh, for more information, you can visit our website at umich.edu backslash tilde UAAO. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. We're now going to turn it over to Maya, if you all could still remain in your seats. Yeah. Hi, I'm so sorry. It, there's been a bit of an exodus. This is purely logistical. Can I see a show of hands of who's hoping to get their books signed? Great. Um, at this point, whether you wait out there or in here will be the same. So if you could please stay seated if you want to get a book signed and any, everybody else is free to go. And then I'm going to get you guys out there by section. Yeah. One more announcement, VSA's mass meeting is Thursday, 6.30 to 8. Thank you. Psych Atrium, third floor.